Cultural diversity, how not to ignore it. Hello, everybody. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, Kristen. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Everyone, we're here on on uh, Signpost for Living with Dr. Kirsten Hunter. And we're here with my lovely dear friend, Danielle. Hello. And we've been, just been discussing your last name, haven't we? I'm going to try. You ready? Mm-hmm. Danielle Abad. Very good. It's not right, though, is it? It is. Try uh, it. You say it. Abad. Abad. That's it. You've got it. You're just being kind. No, 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 no. Okay, so <laughs> I've every- heard a lot worse. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> well, everyone, we're sitting here with um, two gorgeous men who are multilingual, and I'm Australian, and I only speak English. And um, I, I'm just, I've just been sitting here listening to you both speaking Spanish to each other, and um, you didn't need to apologise. I loved hearing it. Ah, oh, well, that's good. <laughs> so, how many languages do you speak? Well, French and English, obviously, I can read, write, I learned fluently. I did my um, Bachelor of uh, Teaching in English, yes. which was uh, quite a feat for me. Yes. Um, Spanish, I can still speak it fluently, but I just find it a little bit more difficult to read and write these days. Right. And when you, you and my husband, John, speak in Spanish together, do you have different dialects? Do you hear, is it different? Well, I can... I can speak two dialects in Spanish. There you go. I can More sp- detail. I can speak Spanish and Valenciano, which is a slightly different form of Spanish. But if you can speak Spanish and you can speak French, mm. Valenciano just really is no problem. Valenciano. Mm. And also Arabic. Well, Arabic when I was living in Africa, yes. So what's your Ara- Arabic capacity there? What's- Very limited these days because I, um, I left Algeria when I was 16, mm. and I didn't return um, until 2010. And, lovely audience, that, that starts off us on our cultural diversity conversation because Danielle has got a very fascinating story which has layers upon layers upon layers that then circles back to the first layer. Exactly. It was just a, a whole circle coming back to the source. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now, when we first met, we we actually worked out that I was more French than you. Exactly, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is which is really quite incredible because um, oh, isn't that funny? Mm, I don't mm. speak a word of French, so obviously I did my ancestry, and I'm Australian, so I've got a lovely mix of most things European, and I've got a good dose of French and Spanish in me. Interestingly, and your heritage. Let's start from the beginning. Is that okay? Yes. So, where were you born? Well, I was born in uh, northern Africa. In a country called Algeria. Yes. Algeria was um, colonised by mm-hmm. the French in 1830. So we've got the French language, we've got the Arabic <clears throat> language. As well as Italian, French and Spanish. Because they, they were the, 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 the three uh, cultures that actually came to Algeria right. when the country was, became uh, part of France. Wow. And um, when 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 France um, moved into Algeria, mm-hmm. uh, there was the the local population, yes, which was made out of Berbers and Moors. Okay, they were the original inhabitants mm-hmm. in Algeria, and um, so they're they're um, religious groups, cultural groups. Well, both groups were Muslim, right? Okay. And uh, when France occupied Algeria, obviously the idea was to uh, populate the country and develop it. True colonization. Pretty much. Yes. Pretty much. And yes. therefore, at that point, um, I guess migration was open, mm-hmm. and the um, the largest communities that came to Algeria were uh, Spanish, Italians, and some French. Uh, population from the north of France mm. after the 1870 war between France and, and Germany. There you go. Okay, and, so we're going um, back a bit there. Oh, yes. Mm. And uh, well, at that point, uh, those populations uh, shifted and moved in particular areas of Algeria mm-hmm. and they assimilated themselves with the... Well, when I say assimilated themselves, that's not really the right word. They just moved in mm-hmm. and um, anybody who wanted to remain 
in Algeria mm-hmm. was offered the French nationality, French citizenship. Right. And and, 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 and was the, it French language as well that was that was taught throughout the schools? Was there a unified absolutely, language? Absolutely. Right. Once once uh, France occupied Algeria, it developed the country, sure. railroads, um, hospitals, mm-hmm. schools, dams, yeah. power stations, the whole lot, you see. And so your family came from Spain. Yes, how, my family came. How far back? If you can have a shot at that. Probably late late um, middle to late 19th century. Right. So shortly after the um, shortly after the um, France moving into Algeria. Right, okay. And at that point uh, most countries in Europe mm-hmm. were really having difficulties. And uh, this new country that was opening in Algeria offered new opportunities. New opportunities. And so you grew up with Spanish spoken through your family, is that correct? Yes, my grandfather and I practically <laughs> spoke Spanish all the time. Yes, that but paint, the painter grandfather you've told me about? Exactly. Absolutely. And so you've got the Spanish coming through and then there was French actually just throughout the country. Well, you see, I was educated uh, in a French school. Yes. My parents spoke French to me. Right. Uh, in fact, it was only my grandfather, my grandmother, and my great grandmother who spoke Spanish to me. Okay. And 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 how about the um, Arabic language? And also, how much contact did you have with people who were of Arabic um, descent? And what was the cultural structure? I guess that's a very inter- interesting point because mm. um, the. Um, the, the, the French school system, for instance, yes. was open both to the indigenous people as yes. well as the people, uh, whether they were of French or Spanish or Italian descendants. Sure. So we, we were together at school, we learned together at school, and yet once school was finished, they went into their camp and we went into our camp, and there was very little contact that could take place between the indigenous people and... Um, so there was a real segregation between the was, two. It and was. And was that socioeconomic? Was the, was the indigenous lower in their socioeconomic group? Unfortunately, very much so. Right. So very what sort of so. jobs would they have? What was their role? All the menial tasks. Right. All the menial tasks. And if you uh, project yourself to 1962 when Algeria um, became independent, mm. uh, my, uh, my belief is that um the the Algerian people weren't prepared to run the country because they had been excluded from any position of influence or power during those 132 years. So when you say they weren't prepared, you mean they weren't as in they didn't have the experience, the know-how because well, they would they were excluded pretty much from being in those positions of pretty education much. and leadership. So they wanted to. Okay, so let's let's. Um, so we've just talked about the history there, mm-hmm. and now we bring ourselves up to what age were you when there was this process of independence, with the the indigenous people, the Arabic people coming in and saying, "Hey, this is our, our Algeria, and uh, you mob can sod off." Pretty much. Basically. Pretty much. So what age were you when that? That kind of decolonization happened because that's enormous, isn't it? Or oh, it was. It was a very long process. It started, to tell you the truth, it started shortly after the um, the Second World War. Right. Okay. Where a lot of Algerian um, young men yes were drafted into the army right to just go and fight the, with the French overseas right and unfortunately more than once were used as cannon fodder. Oh, that's disgusting. Well, exactly. And I'm not talking just about the um, the Algerians. I'm talking about all the other colonies that France had um, in, in Algeria, such as uh, Senegal, Cameroon, etc. Uh, they were just cannon fodder. And that's the mentality that the French, the French people had. Uh, they were a commodity to be used as one wished. Okay. Mm-hmm. So then there was a movement towards wanting independence? Well, after the Second World War, um, there was a, a group of intellectuals, who Algerian intellectuals, who started to um, believe that their, um, they, it was their country. So when you say Algerians, you're saying Arabic Algerians? Yes, 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 yes. 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 
Yeah, and they wanted their country back. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And how long had they been oppressed in that country? How long had their country been stolen from them? Well, since 1830. Right. Since 1830. Right, okay. So, um, uh, so over 100 years. Yes, yes. Mm. And it started, so the, the, the movement of independence really started to take momentum uh, after the Second World War. Sure. And um, the, uh, the um, War of Independence started in 1953. Okay. And it lasted until 1962. So there was an eight or nine year uh, War of Independence, which saw uh, French people and the French locals basically at war with the Algerian population. So suddenly this country is at war and you're a child through this time. I was um, I was um, two years old when it started. Yes. And I was 11 when it finished. Really? Mm-hmm. And what did you witness? Mm, what did I witness? A lot of um, a lot of hatred. Yes. And a lot of violence. Yes. Uh, yeah. Hatred and violence, well, which I really couldn't understand. Because it you was, went to school with these kids, right? Exactly. Was there segregation in the schooling system, or is it still unified during that war? Which is a very strange concept. It is. It is, and uh, the, um, I guess, the seriousness of the of the situation didn't really uh, become that uh, prevalent until about 1960. Mm-hmm. But okay. f- between 1960 and 1962, yeah things really heated up. And I remember my last, my last year of uh, primary school, mm. that was 1962, it was the first time that we had no uh, indigenous Algerians with us in the school because things had started to become so tense and so dangerous. The, the Arab population just, you know, well, the, the, the Arab parents just never sent those yeah, uh, their, their children there. And you, you grew up as a child seeing dead bodies, I think you mentioned. Oh, yes, definitely. So I you mean, say that so casually, that's not um, most well, child's experience. Um, that's something that still surprises me, the fact that I was just so insensitive when I, when I saw people. Desensitised. Desensitised, yes. yes. They're just lying on the ground, just pools of blood around them. And they, what, what age were you? Late primary school, so we're saying, what, 10? 10, 11. You Gee. see, and I, I, I can even remember having thought, well, one less to worry about, you see. Wow, so and, you and were being sort of um, indoctrinated. Pretty much. I was basically that. saying what the adults were talking Us about. Us versus them. But yet you had a dear friend who was Arabic. Is that You told me that once. Well, yes, I went to school with a, with a friend. And the interesting thing is we stayed five years after the independence. Yes. In Algeria. I was there until 1967. And the reason for it is because um, the, the, the little village where I was born is called Merzel Kibir, right. which is an Arab name, which uh, translated is the big harbor. Mm-hmm. Merz is harbor. Yes. El is the. Kibir is big. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's a harbor that really harbored Portuguese, Spanish, and French mm-hmm. um, army. Sure, army, right. And um, after the Second World War and the beginning of the Cold War, yep. the French government realised that uh, they had to build some kind of nuclear-proof um, like compound. A bunker or something. Exactly. Right. To, uh, in case of uh, a nuclear war, mm. where the French government could actually just go and hide mm-hmm. Until things well got better, if if you can say, got uh, getting better, and um, so the installations they had under a mountain under the sea, sure, were quite significant. Right, and um, the French government um, signed an agreement with the Algerian government mm-hmm. to have the exclusive site uh, use of that site for a further fifteen years in order to dismantle all the secret equipment and facilities they had in there. So after the um, indigenous or the, the Arabic Algerians won, there became a point of it being quite civilised where it was like, okay, we're going to have this amnesty for a period of time for, what did you say, five years? Mm-hmm. And then an extended period a period for the military to be able to kind of, you know, get their camp out of there. 
And you stayed through those five years, is that right? Yes, and that, that, that was interesting because at that stage we really, not that we were the majority before the independence, mm. but we were an even smaller majority then we were just almost an insignificant number because Minority, yeah. the large proportion of the of the French population was either encouraged or decided to leave to leave the country so you went from a position of of uh, power in the community to being a guest in from the being country the, from being the the, the, the the dominant the dominant culture, the, the occupant the occupant of course to right. the um yes to the guest right and um that was incredible, and that's when, when I started to realise, gee, did we miss something? Because straight after the independence, yes, the, uh, well, we knew that the war had been lost. Yes. We knew we had the protection of the French government because we were living in that village, and mm. that, be, that uh, remained a French this contained enclave. Space. Yes. But uh, we still lived with them. With the uh, with the indigenous people, and it was interesting because the the part of the village where the the uh, non indigenous population was living yes was actually uh, I won't say invaded, but you know a lot of the uh, indigenous Algerian peop- uh, population moved into those houses which had been abandoned. Yes, of course. So yeah. that's when we started to live a lot more closely mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. the indigenous Algerians. Yeah, something. That hadn't happened before because yeah. they were living in the Arab quarter and we were living in the other part. So there was much more integrated living. That's when I started to see them living mm-hmm. because I only saw them uh, at school. Yeah. I only saw them doing their menial tasks. Yeah. But there was never any real um, closeness or integration. Mm. And that's when, um, that's when it, it made me start to realise that, hmm, look, it could have been different. What do you mean, what could have been different? What were you realising? Well, the fact that we could have probably lived together and enjoy and uh, uh, learn from each other. With integration and Absolutely. mutual respect. Yeah, Absolutely. We don't need to have this kind of ostracised situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then your family moved to France. Yes, we moved to France like most of the uh, uh, people who lived in Algeria. Mm-hmm. And um, I stayed there three years, right? Until I had an opportunity to to come to Australia on an assisted passage. So, when you were in France, that was um, later teen years. Yes, I was in France from the age of sixteen to nineteen. And so, you're French speaking. You're in France. You are French. Um, did you feel part of France? Not really. Yes. Not really, for a number of reasons. Um, <laughs> Our so-called French culture in Algeria yes. was quite different. Of course. To the French French culture. Yeah, well, completely different continents. Absolutely, absolutely. Different, um, um, different um, culinary, um, different cookery, uh, different habits. Um, everything was different. And th- what really, I guess, uh, surprised me the most <coughs> mm. is that um, we weren't, uh, the, the, the French people coming from Algeria weren't very welcome in France. Why? A number of reasons. Right. A nine-year war right. where a lot of uh, French soldiers who'd been sent from France to fight the war mm-hmm. had died. So, reluct- yeah, resentment over the resources and their lives. A lot of money spent spent on that war. And when the independence arrived and all that French population from Algeria uh, returned to France, yes, obviously the government felt obliged to create housing and opportunities and work and whatnot, mm. uh, something that the local French population resented. So you were kind of the French refugees into France. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. There you go, you're changing your hat again, aren't mm. you? And uh, the, 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 the French we spoke was spoken with a different accent than the French uh, in France. Yes, yes, and that's that's further isolating, isn't it? Exactly. So were you presuming you were going to stay in France through that time or you were just a bit lost? I mean, you're a teenager, you're trying to find your path. Totally lost, totally, totally lost. lost. Yeah. I finished my high school then. Yes. And um, to tell you the truth, that 
an idea of coming to Australia just really never crossed my mind. Well, until, it is the other side of the world, literally. <laughs> literally. Exactly. Yeah. Until one day I just opened the newspaper and um, there was the time when the Australian government was still offering assisted passengers mm. to come to Australia. So this is on a ship that yes. would take how well, long to arrive? Oh, it took about four and nearly a month. Um, oh, a month. Nearly a month. That's not as long as my Titanic mind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's quite all right. And to tell you the truth, I had the opportunity to uh, to come over by plane as well if I wanted to. Oh, did you? Okay. But I decided not to. Mainly, um, I just thought, well, a, a month cruise, surely that... Yeah, I wouldn't say can't no Can't miss that, can you? Yeah. <laughs> and so you said goodbye to the family, you're off to Australia. What was your understanding of Australia at that point? Absolutely nothing. Like nothing? I just I just received a few, um, a few magazines and a couple of uh, travel brochures about Australia. See, that's extraordinary. I'm going to go across the world when I really have very little clue of what I'm going to. Let's go. Well... When I think back... It's a bit crazy, isn't it? Exactly. I really think, Danielle, how did you come to get to, 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 to come to that decision? An 18-year-old sense of adventure? Were you 18? Well, I, was, I turned 19, 19 just before leaving France. There you go. So it, for me, well, as every 19-year-old kid, you're just made of stainless steel, nothing's going to happen, everything's going to be all right. It, My parents absolutely just panicked. Absolutely. I mean, I'd never left home. Our eldest child is just just taking off to Australia, out of school, and off he off he goes mm. across the across the mm. country, mm. well, the world. Um, and you also mentioned that you had an interesting uh, passageway on the way here. Yes, yes. Well, this is something that really, I won't say, uh, obsessed me or haunted me, but um, we boarded the ship in in Genoa, in Italy. And it was practically a migrant ship. Right. And we went from Genoa, we went to um, Napoli, Naples. Right. We went to Messina in Sicily. Mm -hmm. Then we went to Athens. Mm -hmm. And in all those destinations, we picked up more uh, migrants. Mm -hmm. And then because the, the Suez Canal was closed at that point because of... Yes, uh, conflict uh, The conflict. Yes. We had to go all the way down uh, the African west coast. So we had to go from Athens all the way out through to uh, the Strait of Gibraltar. Mm -hmm. And on the way, we just sailed past Algeria. You just, you just nipped by for a, for a goodbye. Yes, yes, it was, it was a goodbye because I remember very, very clearly uh, being on the deck and uh, when, when the captain or whoever just said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now just uh, passing Algeria. And I'd, I'd only left Algeria three years before that. Absolutely. So it was very, very recent. And, and how close were you? What could you see? I could only see the coast. I mean, you know, we were that far away, but you could clearly see the coast. Yes. And um, I remember just being told, well, you are going through Oran. Oran is the capital of the state in Algeria. Right. And the little village where I was born was only seven kilometers from Oran. Sure. So I was just looking at th that particular spot. And um, I, I remember clearly just 16 years of my life, they were just, you know, coming back, just memories, good and bad. Obviously, my, my whole life practically uh, was just, Passing you by. Passing me by. Whilst you were in the process of this extraordinary uncertainty of this next adventure. So I said goodbye and... See, I call that courage. I, I call, really do. I call that craziness. <laughs> 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 how, how about we, we agree on both? Yeah, well, no, exactly. How, yeah. how could I uh, ever uh, have thought of doing something like this? You know, and if I had I realised then what that involved... Mm. The way I realized it much later on, mm. I probably would have hesitated to uh, to make that decision. But at that point, I had spent three years in France, which really hadn't been that spectacular. And um, the idea of just traveling to the other side of the world, 
You were ready to set up roots yes, somewhere. Yes, yes. Well, not so much roots at that point, you see, because the contract that signed with the, um, with the government was for a two-year ah, okay. uh, stay in Australia. Right. With uh, the provisor that they paid for my trip over. Mm. Then uh, after two years, if I, did, if I wanted to go back, mm-hmm. all I had to do was pay for my uh, trip back. Sure. If I wanted to go back before the two years, I had to reimburse Mm -hmm. my trip over and pay for my trip back. Sure, sure. So a two-year holiday at worst. Well, exactly. I thought three, four months. Well, what have you got? We've got Perth. We've got Adelaide. We've got Melbourne. We've got Brisbane. We've got Sydney. We've got Darwin. We've got Alice Springs. What a wonderful way to spend two years. Go chase some kangaroos. Exactly. And that's one of the things that I really was looking <laughs> forward to, you know, the kangaroos and the koalas. You Not see? the crocodiles. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no. So this is fascinating. We've got, we've got the Spanish heritage. We've got that Arabian language and culture around you. We've got the French culture. Flick over to France. Then we're coming over to Australia by the age of 19. Mm-hmm. Tell me about your first impressions of Australia. Totally overwhelming. Mm. First, when I started listening to Australian people talking, yes, my first thought was, am I in the right country? <laughs> <laughs> I'd learned English at school where things have <laughs> talked very properly. You know, Jean and Ken are eating porridge in the morning for breakfast and you just arrive here, get a mate, how you going? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> And trying to uh, to have a conversation uh, with someone over the phone oh. was just an absolute nightmare. Yes, I just face to face, I could at least get the mm. get the gist of things. Yes, but over the phone, I felt really. I mean, it really grabbed me in the stomach. It was just panic before just grabbing the phone. Well, to to arrive and presume to speak the language, and then to arrive and struggle with comprehending and speaking with people, that would have been quite scary. It was scary, but at no time did I feel I've done the wrong thing. Right. It was just so, it was a new country, new culture, new language, new people, new foods. And what did you think of the culture and the hospitality of Australians? Well, I was just totally overwhelmed because um, as soon as I arrived in Australia, and I remember just arriving in Brisbane yes. with my two suitcases, just coming out of Roma Street Station. So that's Brisbane, Queensland, everyone, yep. That's it. I uh, came out and there was an old fellow who went, who went by. Mm. He was past the, the, the station and he saw me. I probably was looking lost with my two suitcases. He turned around and he said, G'day, mate. Welcome to Brisbane. Yes. And I thought, how wonderful. Yeah. A, a fellow who just doesn't know me. Yeah. Who's just welcoming me to... He's not um, getting anything out of this. He's just a nice guy. Exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. And uh, shortly after after that, I had been able to secure um, a flat, as they used to call them in those days. Yes. That was in uh, 55 Waterworks Road in Brisbane. Mm. I'll never forget that spot. And uh, I'd ordered a taxi mm-hmm. to take me there because I had no transport, obviously. The fellow... In the taxi, the taxi driver just said to me, oh, you've just arrived, blah, blah, blah. Do you know anybody here? I said, no, I know no one. Mm. And he said, gee, you know, Mm. where do you come from? France, my goodness. So we just started to talk. And what really surprised me was how easy and Mm. um, friendly the conversation was, something that um, in France you just don't do it because it's a different culture. And Australians, just let's talk about that for a minute. Australians, uh, in my travels overseas, I've really noticed by comparison, because you don't know what you've got until you've you've gone elsewhere, we have eye contact, we smile typically, we're warm, we're friendly, we say hello, and the, we're not expecting anything from that. It's no. just a baseline. Mm-hmm. As if in France, for instance, they're not as relaxed and open. Yes. And this is what a lot of French kids who just come to the to, to Australia on a working holiday visa mm. with whom I've spoken on a number of uh, times in here and in back in France yes. they say oh Australians they're such cool people you yes. know they're friendly they're open relaxed uh, they're relaxed mm. yeah well no wonder that was 
quite welcoming for you. So that was, well, <laughs> compare that to, oh, you're one of those Blackfeet Pied Noir. What? Blackfeet what? Well, what? you know, the, the, um, the, um, the French, Algeri- you know, the French people li- living in Algeria right. were called Pied Noir, Blackfeet. Oh, why? There are two versions, and I'm not too sure which one is the right one. Or so even these, these are the French Algerians. That's what they're called by the French. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. yes. And also by the Arabs. Right. Okay. And the, the two versions, and I'm not too sure if yes. anyone is right, but apparently they uh, they saw the, the 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 French soldiers coming with black boots. Okay. And they sure. were so. Black feet. Possibly. But there was also another version where all the migrants who came to Algeria, mm. a lot of them were bare feet mm. because they were just quite poor. Yes. And the decks of the boats, of the, the ships, were covered with tar. Black tar. And black hence feet. the black feet. Well, there you go. So that's it. So it was a real derogatory term. Pretty much, yes. Pretty much, mm. yeah. Now let's let's fast forward. Mm-hmm. We're going to just do a big time travel now. Mm-hmm. Now, um, everyone, uh, Danielle is a extraordinary chef. <laughs> yes, yes. We've got to be spoilt before. Now you came and um, and and do you mind me if I whip us through time here? So, no, no. Please so go you, ahead. You you met your wife. You you had many adventures. You met your wife. You've had two gorgeous sons that are now two gorgeous men. You've got gorgeous grandkids, and in that process, you discovered um, you always did cook with your grandfather. Is that yes, correct? And my you, mother, and your mother, mm-hmm. and they really did a lot of um, farming their own their own vegetables and everything. And you, you have an extraordinary vegetable patch, which I am in great. <laughs> I've gone and taken <laughs> a studious photos of it, haven't I? Because I'm very jealous. Mm. Um, and so you've really just brought your your passion for food to Australia, and it's been your career. Pretty much, yes. It was in me because from from not day one, but mm. very early in my in, in my youth, yeah, I was interested in, uh, in in cooking. Yeah, and my mother was a very good cook, mm. so uh, I was just always watching. And she started to get me to peel potatoes and vegetables sure. and cut things and whatnot. And I was always watching. Yeah, and uh, that's that's just how I learned to cook. And so you've been involved in in the whole food preparation, catering world, and then you were an educator in the food. You even got involved with film, and you were that cool guy on the in the studio in that I imagine in the kitchen that had everything <laughs> decked out, and you were cooking for the audience, and mm. the cameras were on mm. you. So you've mm. had a, a really rich uh, history with with cooking, and you're going to play that down now. Exactly. Yes. So, <laughs> so, something that was totally unexpected. And a natural flair and it's, yeah, so it's just so wonderful that you found your calling with that. And then you came to discover Indigenous Australians. Yes, it took me a while to do that mm. because when I, um, when I came to, to Australia, I, um, well, I was aware that, you know, there was a, uh, an Indigenous population, mm. but in the 70s, uh, the situation was almost the same as in Algeria, where the one population just had their camp, mm-hmm. and the, um, the 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 Aboriginal uh, community just lived on the uh, on the other side, so to speak. So a lot of segregation. Yes, yes, and um, I uh, I had the chance to to meet someone who was involved in providing education to. Um, the Aboriginal population. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started to discover or to, 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 to meet <coughs> the Indigenous population. Yes. And um, I just started to realise how uh, closely related the Algerian and the Australian situations were. The Indigenous Algerians. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, um, but... In Australia, I was able to really learn the culture. How did you do that? How did you get in on that grassroots level? Because I would argue that um, most Australians live in a metropolitan situation. They might have some people, you know, who are Aboriginal in their, in their in their world here and there, but not really, 
Not really. I think that it's it's actually a rare thing to have a grassroots experience. I grew up going out to Kanamala every year of my life. Um, but even then, I was amongst it and had a sense of what the community was about. Yes. But, you know, there wasn't actually that much connection with Indigenous families in Kanamala. So even though I visually was there... I didn't actually live it and experience it on a grassroots. I don't. I actually think there's an incredible segregation. There were two camps, weren't there? Correct. Exactly. Correct. And that's what happened in Nigeria. And the reason why I had this, this incredible opportunity, which has taken me so far, mm. was uh, while I was working as an educator. Yes. I um, I was able to do well to deliver with the help of a another person, mm. a, um, a training program for um, uh, heritage and interpretive tourism. That was a, um, a training program aimed at forming indigenous uh, people mm-hmm. to become, uh, I guess, guides, uh, explaining the culture and whatnot, you know, involving them in developing some sort of um, cultural and indigenous tourism. Okay. Yeah. And that was my introduction. So a resource to really help people to advocate for themselves in the tourism world. Exactly. That's well, exactly. really meaningful. Exactly. Okay, so you were helping facilitate that. And so then um, tell me more about how that, that you, you ended up bringing an indigenous group over back to France. Well. There yeah. you go. Why not? <laughs> Exactly. There's I mean, a there's a mash of your worlds. I love it. Wh- why not? I mean, that 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 um, person who um, was involved with me in delivering that particular training program, yes, uh, was also um, training other other groups of uh, indigenous people, mm-hmm. and um, she offered me an opportunity to maybe um, sell some indigenous art mm-hmm. with my French contacts. Right. And uh, so I, I just started to just, you know, meet more and more Indigenous people, some artists, uh, and uh, that culture really fascinated me. Yes, why? Because, I, well, um, I, I, loved, I loved the fact that um, uh, they've got a, a great respect for Mother Earth. Yes, absolutely. And that really is something that resonates very deeply in me, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the Earth is their mother, uh, and uh, they're only passing through, yep. and their uh, duty is to preserve Mother Earth, nurture it, so that the next generation can take over and continue. The caretakers for this moment. Exactly. Yes. Something that has lasted for probably seventy or 80,000 years without really affecting the, um, the, the, the... We can learn a lot from that, can't we? Oh, Deep respect. That is probably... Well, According to me, that is the, 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 the biggest mistake that, apart from coming to Australia and saying, well, this is ours now, mm. because I'm totally against colonialism. Yes. But um, uh, like in Algeria, and the same thing happened in, in, in Australia, I think that the, we could have learned a lot more from the indigenous po- population. Yes. And we could have avoided a lot of mistakes. And but the, we're still not learning, are we? Well, the most recent mistake is the, the huge fires that we've had a couple of years ago. Absolutely. I mean, you know, look at how the indigenous people can actually just control mm. and just uh, burn the country mm. to, to, to make sure Controlled that you... Controlled fires. Exactly, controlling the fires and reprodu- re- regenerating the, 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 the country and whatnot. You're right, but come the beginning of 2020, wasn't it? We had it. Australia was on fire. Exactly. It was ridiculous. Exactly. But yeah. it, it may not be too late because we are starting to realise that our way mm. is not working. Yeah. So um, So we're learning from people who actually, it's their, their country exactly, historically. Exactly. When we could have learned that, you know, 200 years ago or so. Mm. But I guess, you know, the, 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 the white mentality, we are superior, we are educated. Mm. Uh, these guys just... And so, absolutely, and... and and so you, you took this group over to celebrate their music and their culture and their food over in Nice? Yes, well... Was nice, it in France? Yes, Nice has got a very famous um, carnival of flowers. Ha! 
like a Toowoomba. Exactly. In Queensland, everybody. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, somehow um, I went to a few because between 1970 and uh, probably 2000, I went back to France a few times. Mm. And a couple of times I was there when the carnival were, uh, was taking place. And um, every year, they, um, the, 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 the carnival committee yeah. invites some artists from overseas. Right. And um, some of them are from the States, from South America and whatnot and so forth. And I just had that idea. They've never had any indige- Aboriginal culture. So I um, I organized an appointment with the uh, director of the uh, carnival committee and virtually just put the idea to him, or to her actually, it was a lady. And I said, would you be interested in sure. uh, having a, a troupe of ab- um, Aboriginal dancers from Australia to come and perform at the carnival? She thought that was great. Enthusiastic. <laughs> I wasn't really expecting uh, such a... Uh, an enthusiastic response that quickly, I thought, well, we'll think about it. it as they normally do. The answer was yes, straight away. And so there you were, you had this this carnival where you're celebrating Australian Indigenous people, culture, music, food as well. Mm-hmm. You took some um, kangaroo over there, did you? Well, that that was another another oh. activity that we did. The, the, the first time was to just, you know, bring the dancers. That was more than once. Yes, there were. Two other opportunities. So three times. You three took, times. There that, you go, educating the world. Mm, Good job. So <laughs> can, you, can you believe that? <laughs> now let's go back in time a little bit. You also went back to Algeria as an adult. Yes, in 2008, I think. Can you tell me a little bit about the pennies that dropped while you were there with regard to you're coming back with an adult's mind, with life experience of you know, a different perspective? What was it like going back? What did you realise about this country, this Al- Algeria? Yes, well, I, I really didn't know what to expect because by the time we left, obviously the last five years between 62, time of the independence, to 67, yes, it was, how can I say that? It was an almost a natural situation, you see, because we were in Algeria but we were living in a French enclave. We still had... A contact, a, a, a much more contact with the um, Arab mm. population. Yes, there was but more integration. Yes, which could have been the case all along. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Point to be and made. this is when I developed that uh, friendship with that other uh, Arab friend, right? Who went to uh, high school with me for a while. Oh, His okay. name is Kader. Right. So in two thousand and eight. Somehow he found me on Facebook or on the internet and whatnot. He was able to contact me and he said, Danielle, we haven't seen each other for 41 or 42 years. Really? 42 he, years? Yes, yes. Well, I left in 67 and I went back in 2010. Sure. So he said, Danielle, you have to come. Yes. And um, that just came from nowhere. And yeah. without a hint of hesitation, I said, yes. I'll be there. I'm your man. I'm there. So uh, we organized things and I was able to go there in 2010 to the uh, disapproval of my parents because by the time we left Algeria, Mm -hmm. the feeling was, well, you know, we'd been killing each other for a number of years and the feeling from a lot of my family was we were kicked out of our country. Yes, yes. So they felt displaced because they'd grown up there. They were born there. Well, it was our, it, it was it was our country. Yeah, and and even though historically that wasn't the case, I do understand they were born there, and there's that sense of ownership of their own birthplace. Absolutely, mm. and I, re, I, I you, you can uh, I'm sure um, if the situation were reversed mm. and the the uh, the white Australian population had been kicked out back to England or Scotland or wherever they came from, and the indigenous population had taken over the country, mm. I'm sure the same kind of uh, emotions and feelings would have uh, would have been uh, amongst the sure. the white population. Yeah. We've been kicked out of our country. It's interesting. It's an interesting flip, yeah. And that really is what opened my eyes, mm-hmm. you see? So uh, despite my parents' disapproval and my family disapproval, I went there. 
Yes. Because Kade and I had formed a really strong bond. bond. Absolutely. And uh, Kade had just said, look, you know, I'll be waiting for you at the airport. You can come and stay at my place. Uh, I'll just do whatever you want and I'll take you back to the to the airport. So I knew I was safe. Yeah. And I went out there without any hopes, preconceived ideas, whatnot. I just said, look, it's pointless to just it's, expect or let's just see. Let's just see what happens. Mm. Just and open what, your heart and just go and there. And what did happen? I was just bowled over. By what? By the welcome mm. of the uh, of the of my friend, obviously, and his family, but the whole Arab population, because uh, I ended up catching up with a lot of people I knew. So they were gracious. Oh, gracious and so hospitable, you know, and uh, welcoming. I was able to uh, to go back to the place where I was born, to the place where I lived. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went back to my grandfather's villa. I mm. went back and saw my uh, father's uh, barber shop, and yeah. it, it 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 was it was really intense. It was really intense because that's something I'd never thought you'd ever get would to ever see happen. Again. And then you were coming back with such open arms, warmth, love. Oh, I was welcome, Danielle. This is your country. You can come and stay here with us anytime. And uh, whenever I went and saw, I, I probably saw dozens of people. And yeah. each one of them, Danielle, look, you know, there's a room, there's a bed, you can stay here. Welcome, welcome. The, the hospitality and... Uh, why do you think there wasn't, I mean, absolutely, it's beautiful, but why do you think there wasn't any kind of, you know, you know, stick it to you guys, we won? None of that. Not a hint of it. Not a hint, the Not opposite. Not a hint of it. In fact, I was, um, I, I then realised, I think, why I enjoyed the Australian culture and the, the, the friendliness and the hospitality. Yeah, what? Because that's the nature of that. That's, that's what was happening. Yes, yes. And I said, wow, look at that. There's such parallels. That's why I was so excited to have you come along today mm. because <clears throat> your world has just got these layers where, again, it cycles back and there's these parallels. So, Tell me a little bit, and, and we'll kind of wrap up on this kind of point, if that's okay, where the parallels that you've seen between the Indigenous Australians and the colonisation of Australia and the Indigenous Algerians and the colonisation, and, and you grew up with a, a mindset of, no, the French the French have a right to Algeria and there was a lack of compassion for, for the um, Arabic when you were there, but you've had a full transformation, haven't you? I had to come to Australia to meet the indigenous population to understand what my what the, the first 19 years of my life were like. That's beautiful. It all made sense mm. when I got back mm. to Algeria, a country I visited seven times. Since then. Mm-hmm. And um, I have to thank the... Um, my uh, my arrival to Australia and uh, the acceptance of the of the Aboriginal people to actually take me into their camp because it is quite a process. You just don't step in. Yeah, no. there is a, a particular process, and um, it's thanks to what happened when I met and learned about the Aboriginal culture. Yes, that I was able to go back to Algeria. Yes. And just really, all the pieces fell into place. And uh, the circle was complete. I was in peace. And you know what? This whole path has been a curious mind. It's been an openness to learn. It's been an openness to diversity, hasn't it? It's, a, it's openness to the individual and their, their roots and their background, their identity. Yes, yes, there's a lot of it. Uh, but I, I would like to add also a lot of luck. i've been lucky to be at the right place at the right time i disagree with you plenty of people stand at doors and they don't enter them they don't they don't go and open that 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 uh exchange with warmth and and um with an attitude that has the other person reciprocate so no i don't think it's luck at all i think it's you I'll have to agree partly with you. I yes, hope you, you know. do, because I'm <laughs> right. <laughs> no, seriously, I really, I really, I love, I love your attitude and I think that it would just be so wonderful for people to 
be open to to learning and respecting and and genuinely integrating through through not trying to um, assimilate but by celebrating the difference but you have to learn about the difference exactly i yeah. think you have to be curious yes you have to be respectful most of all absolutely you have to be able to uh to, to, to will a uh, will to to learn yes and also accept that other cultures are just as interesting if not more interesting than your own culture no question no That's question it. Oh, thank you, Daniel. I appreciate it so much. You're it's been along. my pleasure. <laughs> it's been fun. I've enjoyed that. We'll so have I. Keep talking, of course. So have I. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, thank you so much. Now, let me just tell everyone where they can find me. The webpage, kirstenhunterauthor.com. Facebook, Kirsten Hunter Author and Instagram, Kirsten Hunter Author. Twitter, Kirsten Hunter AU. YouTube channel, Psych in Your Car. Did you know that? Mm. There you go. And this is the podcast sign post for Living with Dr. Kirsten. I'm like, Daniel, I really appreciate your time and I love your story. And I'm just, next time I come to your house, I want to go and look through all of your intricate little, you know, artifacts of your life. That's a deal. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Kirsten. No worries. Thank Bye. you. Bye.